we like our comfort. We like to be comfortable. And we have been talking over the last couple of weeks about praying a dangerous prayer. Learning to really put it on the line when we pray. Um, and unfortunately, I think too many of us need to go to God and say, forgive me. I, I know you, you want to show me your love and, and you wanna, I want you to give me the eyes to see the needs in others and a heart that dares to get involved where you're working. But we're afraid to give up our comfort. We're afraid to take that step. And so what, what I want us to lead us to be able to say is whatever you want, whatever you need, Lord, send me. You know, last week we talked about praying, um, search me, O God, and know my heart, and test me, and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me, and lead me in the way everlasting. And, and the week before that we talked about dangerous prayer. We prayed about, you know, breaking me, and, and living the broken life. Break me of anything that keeps me from being intimate with you. Today, we're going to talk about praying what was probably the toughest of the three prayers. And we're going to pray a prayer of availability. And, and what I've noticed, and this is just based on observation, so many of us struggle with being available for God. Uh, and that's what I've noticed, that this is just, you know, that every week, it seems like we struggle so hard to say, God, use me. I want to be a tool in your hands. Because we're so focused on what we consider to be important. You know, so many of our prayers, and, and I've done prayer ministry before, and I've, I've talked to people about prayer, and you know the prayer you hear the most, Bill? God, give me, give me, give me, bless me, bless me, bless me, help me, help me, help me. You know, God, would you do this for me? God, would you heal my grandma? God, would you help me in school? God, would you help me with my car? Would you help me with a job? God, would you bless me as I do such and such? God, bless the food I eat. Absolutely and completely. There's nothing wrong with those prayers. But I think we've turned prayer into going to God as if he's Santa Claus and we're making wishes. God, give me this. God, help me there. God, do this. God, do that. God, do this. God, do that. God, give me, give me, give me. Bless me, bless me, bless me. Help me, help me, help me. And, and, and I don't think... That's really what prayer is about. Instead, I think it's more dangerous and it's it's more realistic to say, God, what would you have me do? How can you use me today? Not just, God, hey, do this, bless me, keep me safe, but God, am I your, I am your servant. And I want to be available for wherever or whatever or whoever you call me to. And it's called a prayer of availability. And let me tell you, when you pray this prayer, God could direct you in a lot of different ways. He may lead you to go to a different city. He may reveal a calling in your life that you'll never ever expected before. He may lead you to stay somewhere when, when you just knew you were supposed to go somewhere else. And he may move you to break up with somebody. Or, and he may give you an upgrade. He may say, okay, he may lead you to a different job. He might call you to serve somewhere. He might move you from, from being a cat lover to a dog person. I don't know. But when you make yourself available to God, it's incredibly dangerous prayer we're going to learn to pray today, but it's going to change you. See, people think that what we do when we pray is we're changing God. We're, God never thought of that before. God, I, I, you know, I, I know you never thought of this, but how about this? Now, look, guys, God is all-knowing and all-powerful and all-seeing. So it's not like when you pray, you're changing his mind. So what's prayer accomplish? Prayer accomplishes changing the person doing the praying. You are changing as you pray. It is altering your perspective to come in line with what God wants. And so we want to look at the Old Testament and through the New Testament, and we're going to see that God calls people. It doesn't mean your phone rings and he calls you on the phone and says, Hi, this is God. But what he does, it means he speaks to people. He prompts them. He moves them. He leads them to say something, or to do something, or to go somewhere, or encourage, or to speak truth. God will call those who know him to do something that he wants done. And there are different responses to God's call. And we're going to talk about those three responses 
to lead us in our dangerous prayer. You know, I remember reading one day, there was this um, church, and, and the pastor was going to be out, and he got a brand new answering machine. And the name of the church was our God, our, um, God the Redeemer. I think it was a Lutheran church. And on the answering machine, he didn't pay much attention to it. And this guy calls and gets the answering machine. And so the pastor calls him back, and the guy has caller ID. And um, But the caller ID kind of shortened the name. And the guy was, you know, he was really messed up, and he really didn't know where he was going. And he was talking about committing suicide and all this stuff. And he said he got this phone call and he looks down at the caller ID and it says, God the Redeemer calling. And he was shocked because God was calling him. He had God's phone number. Now, he came to realize what was going on, but in the meantime, God used that to open a door. And the guy became a Christian through that little business because he got a phone call and his caller ID said it was God. We get calls from God all the time and, and I guarantee you none of you have gotten a phone call from him. Um, and God answers in a lot of different ways. Sometimes he answers through other people. Sometimes he calls you through something you'll hear at church or something something the old pastor says. You know, oh, well, Pastor Mike, he actually made some sense right there. Maybe that was God at work. Um, you know, I don't know. Maybe it's your wife. Maybe sometimes God actually uses your spouse to direct you in the direction he wants you to go. Yes, I know. That's an amazing thought. Sometimes even your kids. But there's three different responses I see in the Bible of how we can respond to God's call. And I think the first one is, well, here am I, but I'm not going. That was the Jonah call, right? Jonah responds to God's call this way. He said, here am I, I'm not going. Now, some of you can relate to that. Here am I, God, but I'm not going where you're sending me. I don't like that. Jonah chapter 1, verse chapter one, verses 1 through 3, God spoke and said, Go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it because its wickedness has come to before me. And what does Jonah, Jonah do? Jonah doesn't say, oh, that's all right, God, cool. Let's get on the next train to, to uh, Nineveh. Let's head out the next wagon train or whatever you go by. No, what does he do? He gets in a boat and goes the other direction. He goes as far away from Nineveh as he can get. He says, God, I'm here. I hear your call. I'm not going. I'm going to drag my feet. I'm going the other direction. And I wonder how many have had similar experiences. You, you felt prompted to do something and or God, I'm supposed to reach out, or God, I'm supposed to say something, or God, I'm supposed to help this person. And here I am, God, but I'm not going today. I'm not going. And you know, Jonah learned his lesson. Jonah got tossed in the ocean and gets swallowed by a big fish. And God has the fish, you know, Jonah finally repents in the fish. Takes him on a, an air-conditioned submarine ride right to Nineveh. And spits him out on the beach. And and if you've heard me talk about this before, because we, we did a series a couple months ago, a couple years last year, I guess. I'm trying to think how long. They all sort of run together after a while. Um, we talked about getting rid of your inner Jonah. You know, choosing not to be your inner Jonah. And one of the things we learned is that the Ninevites worshipped a fish god. And so Jonah comes up on the ocean. I can just picture this, you know. He gets spit out on the ocean. He's got you know, a piece of seaweed right there in the forehead. And, and his skin's bleached white from the gashes in the fish's stomach. And he comes walking up the beach. And there's this Ninevite fisherman sitting out there fishing away. And he sees this guy come up. And he's gotten spit out by a fish. So he knows that he's a messenger from their god, he thinks. And the guy comes up and says, repent. And he does. You know, And, and everybody in the city repents. And then Jonah gets mad about it. Because he didn't want God to be merciful. He wanted God to punish these people. But see, we do the same thing. God will call us to do something. And it's not something that we like. It's not something that's comfortable. It's not something that we can say, Oh, this sounds like a great idea. God, I love this. I'm so glad you're going to do this. 
And we go, well, no, God, I don't want to do that. That's scary. That's someplace I've never been before. Hear him, God, but I'm not going. I hear you. I know you called me, but I'm not going. I'm going somewhere else. How about this, God? I hear what you're saying, but I'm going over here. Don't we do that in church? God says, church, here's what I want you to do. I want you to reach out to this group of people. And instead of reaching out to them, we decide we're going to do it our own way. Well, God, we don't like your plan, so we're going to do it our way. And here's what we're going to do. We've got all this planned out. We're going to have all these, we're going to have a festival and a movie theater and, and two-headed dancing snakes and whatever else you can come up with. And we're all going to have this big giant party in the parking lot. Okay, I'm being ridiculous, but the truth is that we, we, we get focused on doing it our own way. And when God calls and says, this is what I want done, oh no, God, we've got a better plan. We're going to do it this way. We're not going to obey you because we're going to do it our own way. And we know what he's calling us to do. And we're sitting there saying, you know, I know I should go. I should do what he calls me to do. And, and here I am, though, but not today. I'm going to put it off. I'm not going to do it this way. I'm going to do it that way. So here my God, Jonah would say, I'm not going. I refuse. I'm going my own direction. I'm going to do my own thing. Well, anybody who's been at Del Rio, I'm Del Rio, boy, <laughs> anybody who's been at Grace Baptist long enough will know that one of my first teachings, one of the things that I emphasize a lot is that God is always at work. He's at work already. He didn't require us to get busy in Second Life when we decided to do something. He didn't come in here, oh, you know, Mike, I'm so glad you're here because I really never thought about having a ministry in Second Life. No, he was already at work here. He just invited us to join him in it. That's what God does. God says, I'm at work. Here's what I'm doing. You come join me. I am going. I'm love you, and I'm sending you out an invitation to join me. And so we've got to adjust our thinking to join him. Sometimes that requires we alter our plans. We alter what we think is important to do what he's doing, to see where he's going. And we make those adjustments, and then God is still at work. And so, our problem is that we say, well, here am I, God, but I'm not doing it your way. I'm doing it my way. Don't you think that's kind of what the disciples had a problem with? Here am I, God, I'm going to follow Jesus, but he's not doing it the way I thought he would. He's not come to liberate us from Rome. And so, we need a committee to plan out how Jesus will liberate us from Rome. I am so glad that God does not work through committees. I'm going to tell you the honest truth. I can just, I, I terrify to think what would happen if Jesus had, had a, a, an elder council to dictate his plans. Nothing wrong. There's nothing wrong with being elders because it's a biblical term and, and, and the elders and the deacons play important roles in a church. Deacons are servants, elders are basically, and pastor is also an elder. That's what an elder is. Biblically, I realize that some church governments have turned it around to mean different things, but but we, we come up with all this stuff and we make all these plans and say, well, God, God, here's what we're going to do. And God says, no, I'm already work over here. Come join me. Come join me. Don't call me and say, well, God, this is what we want you to do, and this is how we're going to do it, and this is how we plan to do this, and this is what we want to do. And God's saying, but I'm already working over here. You come join me. So often churches get so caught up in doing it their own way. That they'll say, well, here am I, God. I'm willing to do it my way. But I'm not willing it to do it your way. The second prayer that we will find response in the Bible is, well, here am I, God, send someone else. That's great, God. I'm so excited you're doing that. Who are you sending? Oh, no, not me, God. I'm not going. Send somebody else. Somebody else is going in my place. I'm not capable. You know, I, from Moses, the book of Exodus, it talks about 
Moses, God calls him and says, and, and just picture this, this, this conversation. Moses comes up, he sees the burning bush, he turns aside to see what it is, and God calls him out of the burning bush, and he says, I've heard my people and my cry, and I've, I've heard all their pain and their sorrow, and, and I realize what they're going through, and the time is up for the Canaanites, because I gave them 300 years to repent, and they didn't. By the way, that's in the book of Genesis, you look it up. He didn't just hold off because it was just, you know, it wasn't a matter of him not being able to do anything. God gave the people of Canaan time to repent. So it wasn't like he was going to destroy them. He gave them time, and they didn't. And so he was going to liberate Israel. And so he calls Moses. And what does Moses answer? Well, first he says, oh, but God, who am I? I you know, I'm nobody. Uh, 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 no, God, I can't do this. And he starts arguing with God, and he gives all these excuses. Well, I'm, I can't speak, and... What if they don't believe me? And, and, and he, he, that's the one that really kills me. Well, who do I tell them sent me? And God says, you will tell them that. He, and he gives him his name. You know, that's what God first reveals his name. I am Yahweh. I am, I was, I will be, I you know, always will be. And he goes through all that. And then he says, and they will believe you. And then he says, well, what if they don't believe me? You know, that's one of those things like, wait a minute. God just told you he's going to believe you. Um, but anyway, and don't get me wrong. We do the same thing. We just don't do it quite as blatantly as Moses did. But Moses gets to the end of the, the end of the, the conversation with God, and what does he say? Send someone else. I'm not going. I'm here. I'm excited. I'm thrilled you're going to rescue our people. But who are you sending beside me? And God says, fine. I'll send your brother. You're going to. You don't get out of this. But I'm sending your brother with you. And you're going to be, he's going to speak. He's going to be your voice. He's going to be excited to hear about this. Not like you, Moses. He's not going to give me a bunch of excuses. He's going to be thrilled to death that we're going, that we're going to liberate the people. And call them out and take them to the promised land. Send someone else. I'm just not the right person. You know, it's so easy for us to do that. Well, you know, God, I know that you say we're supposed to tithe. But I just don't have it. Maybe somebody else can tithe. Or hear him, God, you know, um, I just don't have as much time as that person. So I don't have time to serve because I'm just too busy. Or God, I, I, I can't help out with youth group because I don't have any teenagers. And so I don't like teenagers. They're smelly and they don't wash well. So I, I'm just, I just don't want to serve them even though that's what you called me to do. Or, here, God, you know, it, it, I, I, I haven't got any money, but that person over there is rich. Maybe you should prompt them to give, God, because I just don't have it. I can't afford it. I don't have as much time as that. That person, that lady over there, she's a stay-at-home mom, and she's got kids, so maybe she can help in the nursery, but I'm not helping. And all the stay-at-home moms came out with a knife, with no makeup on, their hair messed up, saying, you have no idea. That's what we all think. She can do it, he can do it, they can do it, they're better equipped. I don't have time. Here am I, God. Send someone else. I don't have time for this, God. Send someone else. Somebody else needs to take care of this, God. My job, we seem to think, is to go to church and sit in a pew. I've always wondered why they call them pews, but anyway. To go sit in the auditorium and stare at the back of somebody's head while a guy in the front yells at you. That's what we think our job is as a Christian is to stare at the head of somebody behind us. Unless you got the fancy seating where the seats in the front are lower than the seats in the back and you're staring over that person's head and you're watching the guy up the front. And some of you think your job in church is to come in here and take a nap. And some of you think your job in church is to sing really loud or to be entertained because church is there to entertain you. But don't call me serve. I'm not here to serve. I'm just here to be entertained. I'm here for you to entertain me. And all church is for us is being entertained. And Moses says, Here my God, 
I'm excited you're going to say this. Who are you sending? Not me. Send somebody else. Send my brother in his place. They can do it, but I don't have time. Here, my God. Send someone else. So we've got the Jonah response. It says, here am I. I am not going. And then we've got the Moses response. It says, here am I. Send somebody else. I'm not going or send someone else. Seems to be the modern church response to every call made by God. We have gotten it in our heads that the only people that are supposed to serve God in the church is the pastors and the staff. And nobody else is called to do anything other than to be entertained. You want to really irk me? And, and this one's one of my favorite, or this is one of my pet peeves. Somebody tell me, well, I'm not going to that church anymore because I'm just not being fed. You know, that, 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 you know I, I don't really feel like I'm getting anything out of the sermons. And you ask them, well, are, are, you, are you participating in the life of the church? Are you being involved with other members of the church? About that, guys. Uh, sometimes the uh, technology is my friend and sometimes it's not. I apologize for that. <laughs> anyway, everybody should be able to hear me now. Yeah, we lost voice altogether. Lost voice on live stream and in world, so there's going to be a little break. So I apologize for that. So anyway, what I was what I was saying was that we reached that point where it's either here am I, I'm not going, or here am I, send someone else. And our churches are filled with people who are spectators. That's all they're doing. They're just going along for the ride. When God says... I call you to make disciples. That's, you know, that, that thing in Matthew 28, guys, that's not just a good suggestion. That's God's command. Go and as you are going, make disciples. Everywhere you go, everything you do is about being his representative on this planet. And you don't have to be a pastor to do that. You don't even have to be a Sunday school teacher to do that. So, But there's a third response I find in Scripture. And Isaiah prays a very dangerous prayer. This is the prayer that I want us to pray. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 8, says this. Isaiah says, Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Notice what Isaiah said in the prayer response back to God. I want you to notice what he did not say. Notice he didn't say, Where are you sending me? Is the climate nice? What's the cost of living? Is there a pay scale? Are there benefits? How much vacation do I get? Right? What's the cost of living? How much vacation do I get? He didn't ask what the benefits were. He didn't ask what the circumstances were. Notice what he says. Here I am. God, send me. This is, this is I don't need to tell you, a very dangerous prayer. He's not asking God, well, what about this? And what about that? And what if it's dangerous? And, and what if I don't have the right clothes? Or... You know, what if my cell phone doesn't work there? And God says, and he says, Here my God, send me. And I want to encourage you this week, and this means become a daily part of your prayer life. When you wake up, pray, God, I give you my mind. I give you my eyes. I give you my mouth. May I speak what you want me to say. May I hear, what you, hear your truth today and have the wisdom to reject that which is not true. Here are my hands, may they be used to build your kingdom. Here are my feet, God. Let me lead me to where you want me to be. Help me to do what you want me to do, God. Essentially, God, here I am. Send me. I want to challenge you. I want to dare you. I want to motivate you to pray that prayer. Here I am, God. Send me. I am available. Here I am. You have permission to interrupt me. You have permission to send me where you want to go. I want you to do with me what you would have me, what you would have of me, Lord. You have permission to take me out of my comfort zone. To send me to a place that I'm not really sure about. Years ago, a young kid from Iowa, God, who'd never been to the city, 
God called him to go to New York City. and work with the street gangs there. He had no clues what he was doing. He was this old farm boy from Iowa. It seemed like it was nuts. But you know what? He didn't question God. He said, okay God, I'm going. And he went to New York City. And he worked really hard to share his faith. Build a church there started a ministry, reached out to the gang members. One of the most ruthless members of one of the gangs in New York City. Yeah, thank you. It was a kid named Nicky Cruz. Nicky was an enforcer. He was a violent, violent young man. And Bruce Wilkerson, who was this Iowa farm boy, who'd never worked for gangs before, had never really been in the major city before, reached out to him. And through his ministry and everything else, Nicky Cruz became a believer. They even made a movie about it. It's called The Cross and the Switchblade. But here's the reality. If Wilkerson had said, Oh no, God, <laughs> that's scary. I'm not going there. I don't know anything about it. I don't have the details. You didn't give me blueprints. What's the vacation plan like? Mm -mm. Here, my God, send me. Here, my God, use me. I'm available. I'm a tool in your hands. If that costs me everything I have, then God, I will serve you with all I have. If that caused me to go to the deepest, darkest jungles of Africa to proclaim the gospel to anybody who will listen, then God, here am I, send me. See, that's why that prayer is so dangerous. Because basically what you're telling God is, you have permission to do whatever it takes to use me. To use the gifts you gave me to minister to those around me. Now, I'll be honest, most of you will probably not get sent to Sudetenland or someplace like that. But he might call you to witness and to proclaim the gospel at your job. He might call you to give up the things that you think are so important so that you can minister to those around you. Here my God, send me. I'm available. I'll do whatever you go. I'll, I'll, I'll do whatever you call me to do. Send me. I want to be usable in your hands. See, I have a collection of tools in my garage. Now, anybody who knows me knows that why I have tools, I'm not sure. Because I am not Mr. Handyman. Okay? This is the kid, yes, and I'll be, the, I'll be the first to admit this, who tried to fix a toilet once. Once. And um, we spent three and a half hours trying to replace the toilet. And then we called the plumber who spent another four hours repairing the damage we did. Simple project, right? But I am not Mr. Handyman. But I have all these wonderful, nice, shiny tools, right? Skill saw and jigsaw and all these other things. Drills and hammers and a 101-piece ratchet set. And, you know, all these fancy... Now, the reason I have all that stuff is because I used to work... I worked for Sears at one point. And we used to get the tools wholesale when people returned them because it was that or they would throw them away. You know, that's what they do when you return things to Sears. If you say it's defective, they can't resell it to other customers. So they'll do one of two things. They'll either sell it to the employees at what, you know, at, at a really discounted price, or they'll, they'll destroy them. They don't have any other purpose for them. It's not like they can repair them. So, and it's one of the reasons Sears is probably going out of business. Yeah, but beside that point, I have all these tools, you know what, and I walk out tomorrow and I say, you know what, I'm going to change the oil in my car, and so I get my skill saw out, and I try to use my skill saw to open the oil, to change the oil, I'm not going to do much good. I need the right tool for the right job, and God has gifted each one of us to be the right tool for the right job. 
I don't know what he's gifted you to do. I don't know where he's got you planned or where he plans to use you. But every last one of us have a gift that God has given us. And he's saying, look, here's where I want you to serve. Here's what I want you to do. Here am I. Send me, Lord. Might mean that you're changing diapers in the two-year-old room at your church's nursery on Sunday mornings. Yes, I know. Fate worse than death. It might mean going to your elderly neighbor who can't get out anymore and mowing her grass without asking, without expecting any money, just ministering to her. Maybe it's taking lemonade to your neighbor or to your friend or to the guy behind you who, who screams at your dogs and throws water balloons at them when they bark at him. God's maybe using you to minister to him. I don't know where God will put you, but that's why this prayer is so dangerous because it's saying, God, you have permission to use me any way you want. And I want to challenge you, I want to dare you, to motivate you to pray a similar prayer. Here am I, God. I'm available. You have permission to interrupt me. If you want me to go somewhere, I'll go. If you want me to say something, I'll say. If you want me to stay somewhere, I'll stay there. If you want me, this is where you planted me and this is where you're using me, then this is where I'll stay at. And I'm not going to, I'm going to stop looking around to see where else is better out there on the horizon. God, I hate this job, but you know what? This is where you gave me, and until you move me, I will stay where you planted me. I will bloom where I'm planted, Lord, and I will serve you no matter where you leave me, wherever you have me. And I will stay here until you open the door somewhere else. If you want me to simply to be quiet and trust you and stand still and see your deliverance, then God, I will stand still and see your deliverance. And I'm not going to worry about it and fret about it or manipulate the circumstances to change it. If you want me to give something away, if you want me to use my time or whatever you need me to do, whatever it is, God, here I am. I am utterly and completely and totally available to you. I am your servant and you are my God. So here I am. Send me. Use me. And when you start praying that, I guarantee God is going to interrupt you. God will prompt you. God will move upon you. And suddenly you'll recognize that God has a lot for you to do when you pray. Here I am. Send me. Now I know that makes it sound like it's something really simple to do. And I realize that we need to get a way to get that attitude before God. How do we fully surrender our lives to him? And I want to try to answer that. We looked at Isaiah 6, 8, and I, I want to look at the verses that led up to the surrendered prayer that the prophet Isaiah made. What do you need to do to fully surrender to God? There's three things. Okay. First off, you need a genuine experience in the presence of the Lord. If you're not a believer, none of this will, will matter to you. Okay. Verse 1 says this, In the year the king Uzziah died, he said, I saw the Lord high and exalted seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. And this is Isaiah praying. What happened? Isaiah saw the presence of God. He had a real experience in God's presence. He saw him in all his majesty and all his glory. And the text goes on to talk about how those angelic beings named Seraphim and all of these angelic beings are worshiping and praising the living God, crying out, Holy, 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 Holy is the Lord all God Almighty. And when Isaiah saw the presence of God, when he experienced the glory of God, it completely transformed who he was. Why is it that you might not be available to God? Because maybe you've not really had a presence, had not experienced the presence of God. Your prayer life is non-existent. You don't spend any time with Him. You don't read your words. You don't worship with other believers. Your, your spiritual walk is non-existent. Or maybe you've never accepted Him as Savior. You know, that, that assumes, all this assumes, that if you're going to be usable, you got to belong to Him. He's not going to use somebody else's tools. You've got to be surrendered. You've got to be sold out. And so you've got to belong to Him, and that means you need to accept His Son as Savior and Lord. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret. I, I get people ask me once in a while, Mike, have you ever thought about quitting the ministry? 
and I'm going to tell you that right now, I have. More times than I care to confess. I get discouraged, I get frustrated, I look around, I don't seem to be going anywhere, the church doesn't seem to be growing. But you know what? come to realize that God isn't interested in me building my church. He's interested in building his kingdom. And my job, if you've listened to me on this weekend, my job is to be obedient and do the work. My job is to be strong on the Lord and do the work. That's what we talked about on Sunday. And uh, there's, there's been time when I've let, taken my eyes off of God, placed myself and looked around and started comparing myself to others and got all involved in this. And you know what? The reality is that if my focus was, God, here am I, send me, do what you want me to do, I'm sold out to him. And if he points me and he puts me at a task, no matter how difficult it is, you keep doing it. You keep going. You keep working at it and allowing him to be in control. And you think, can I keep going? But in the presence of God, you experience real submission. God, I've just been with you and I'm your servant in anything you want of me. Some of you may say, well, that's really never happened to me before. I want to tell you right now, it absolutely can. And God wants to reveal himself to you. Okay? In fact, scripture teaches that when you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. You don't have to go to the middle of the woods somewhere and get in alone with God. It can be in your car. It can be it can be at your house in a closet or out in the backyard by yourself, preferably not with my dogs. You can just sit down and, and sing a worship song in the car on your way to work and suddenly realize that you're in God's presence. He's comforting me and he it, it, it could be you know, when you're, you're praying a good night prayer with your four-year-old and you suddenly realize God is with us right now. When you draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Maybe you're not as available as God would, that you should be. Maybe it's because you haven't sought him in a while. Because when you experience his presence, you will be transformed. In the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord high and fit lifted up and his glory was everywhere. What do you need to surrender to God? You need a genuine experience with the presence of God. The second thing you need is a genuine awareness of your sinfulness. A genuine awareness of your sinfulness. In fact, I'm going to argue that one of the biggest cultural lies that people believe today is this. I'm a good person. No, you're not. No, you're not. I'm not a good person. You're not a good person. She's not a good person. He's not a good person. None of us are good people. Let me tell you this. Without Christ, you're not. You're evil. The Bible says your heart is deceitfully wicked in all its ways. Your sin makes you a horrible, pathetic, evil sinner in the eyes of God. And our righteousness is a filthy rags, Bill. That's right. It was then Isaiah, who's looking at the goodness of God, and he realizes the badness of him. You know, I'm, I'm one of the reasons that I used to teach that you prayed what we call the Acts Prayer. Anybody ever remember learning that? You, When you pray, you pray adoration first, and then confession, and then thanksgiving, and then supplication. You know, and, and I realize it's a formula in, in, but the reason I always believed you taught, you, you adore him first for who he is, but when you look on him, when you come into his presence, when you recognize who he is, I promise you, and you look back at yourself, you're going to realize what a sinner you are and what you need to clean up. When you look into the presence of God, I promise you, you're going to see who you really are. And it's exactly what happens to Isaiah. He comes into the presence of God and he says, 
<laughs> what was me? Woe is me. I am ruined. I am done. I am nothing. I am pathetic. I am a sinner. I have nothing to offer. He's holy and I'm not. And he's righteous and I'm unrighteous. He's full of glory and I'm full of sin. Woe to me. I am ruined. For I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among a people of unclean lips. And my eyes have seen the King. The Lord God Almighty. What does it take to get to a place where you're fully surrendered? Here am I, God. I'm yours. Send me. It takes a genuine experience with the presence of God, and it takes a genuine awareness of your own sinfulness. To come to the conclusion of who you really are. No mass, no parades, no pretending. God, I look on you, and then I realize who I really am. But it doesn't stop there. Because number three, it takes a genuine understanding of God's grace. When you understand just how amazing His grace is, it brings you to a point of full surrender. Verse six says this, Isaiah said, Then one of the seraphim, that's one of the angelic beings, flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken from the tongs, from the altar, and when he touched it to my mouth and said, See, this has touched your lips, then read aloud. And he said, This is in this is amazing reason, this is grace. Your guilt is taken away, and your sins have been atoned for. He saw the presence of God, he recognized his sin, and God gave him grace. He made him clean. One touch, one touch from God. And his sins were forgiven and completely atoned for. Your lying lips forgiven. Your lustful attitudes forgiven. Your self-centered thoughts forgiven. Your angers, angerous outbursts forgiven. Every secret sin you've never told anybody before, but God knows them all, forgiven as if they never happened. Now see, this all happens back in the Old Testament. Now let me point to you something, guys. Jesus Christ died for your sins. He why, he did this on the cross. Okay. God has already said your sins are forgiven. If you've accepted him as Savior and Lord, you're forgiven. God separates your sins as far as the east is from the west and remembers your sins no more. And when you confess your sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and to cleanse you from all unrighteousness. When you understand the grace of God, it transforms everything. The same way that coal that touched his lips removed his guilt, the blood of Jesus covers our sins. And when we recognize that we don't bring anything, but Jesus brings everything, we don't have anything to, to hold us up and say, these are wonderful people. God did not say, you know, I'm going to save these guys because Michael Boyd was just such a great man. And I really think he would be a blessing and he would really be a real addition to our team. You know what God saw when he saw me? I was a sinner. And Jesus saved me. What I deserved was hell. And yet my God chose to send his only begotten son to die for me, Michael Boyd, on a cross. So that my sins might be forgiven. So that I might be transformed. And he didn't just do it for me. He did it for Bill Cockrell. And he did it for Mr. Guillermo out there. And he did it for Jill. And he did it for every last one of you in this room. And everybody listening to me on live stream. God sent Jesus Christ to die for you. That's why it says in John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. And when you get that picture in your head, when you come to understand the grace of God, it will transform everything. Here my God send me becomes, God, I can't wait to go. I'm here to serve you because you've done so much for me. 
we don't bring anything, and Jesus brings us everything. And when we sense God's presence, when we're aware of our own sinfulness, and we experience the unmatched, undeserved grace of God through Jesus Christ, our only reasonable response is, Here am I, God. Send me. It's not my life. It's yours. It's not my desires. It's yours. One of the most dangerous prayers you pray is, God, I'm all yours anywhere, anytime, anything. How you want to use me, God, is up to you, not me. And this isn't some kind of, well, gosh, I've got to pray this prayer because Jesus died for my sins. This is, I get to do this. This isn't a duty. This is a privilege. You get to serve him. I get to wake up. Up, I have a day that God has made. He's given me gifts. He's put me at this moment in history. Because at this time, I can bring glory to him. He's going to bring people across my path today that need encouragement. He's going to bring people that have needs. He's going to give me exactly what they need. I just have to be willing and able and have the courage to use it. And trust God to use me. This isn't, oh, i got to serve God and trudge along and this is so horrible. This is, I get to serve God because he served and loved me through Jesus. I get to give everything that I have to him. This isn't a duty. This is a privilege. And the best part about this isn't a, just a one-time decision. This isn't like, in 2002, I prayed that prayer and I surrendered it all to him. And on that day, and ever since then, no, it's not a one-time thing. It's a daily decision. It's a daily event. Every day you get up saying, God, here am I, send me. The reason it's daily is because you have been born into God's family. And in other words, you have been called, and if you have called on Jesus and have transformed, here's what happened. Your spirit came to life. And from that moment on, there was a war going on inside of you. There was a war because there was a flesh side of you, and this is what the Bible calls. It's not your skin. It means your own selfish desires. And here's a spirit side of you. Your flesh is at war with your spirit. And your flesh wants to do what you want to do. And you need to say, God, here am I. I send me. Your flesh is going to be saying, no, I'm not going. Or please send somebody else. But your spirit wants to do what God wants you to do. To please him. How do we really learn to daily choose to die to our flesh so our spirit could live? Simple. What we feed grows, and what we starve dies. That simple. If we flee our flesh, give me, give me, give me, give me, give me. It's all about me, 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 me. I'm not going to do that. My life's too important. I'm too valuable. I don't have time to make a difference. Somebody else can do it. I love Jesus and everything, and I'm going to heaven, but, but I'm not going to do anything like that. That's feeding your flesh. Instead, if you deny our flesh and feed your spirit in the presence of God, I'm seeking God, I'm in his word, I'm growing spiritually, we're sharpening one another, I'm using my spiritual gifts, I am the church, I am the church in the world, I am showing love, then your spirit is growing and your flesh is dying and you're closer to God and you recognize him. I'm available because I'm available, God asked me to do more. Whoever is faithful with little, God will trust with much, much more. Why is he trusting some people with much? They were faithful with a little, and he gave them more to do. That's why the Apostle Paul said this, I die daily. No, it doesn't mean, pow, I'm dead. It means that I am dying to myself every single day, so that Christ will live through me. He said, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And I'm going to tell you right now, you grow whenever we experience the presence of God and when we're aware of our own sinfulness and we experience the grace of God who forgives us and we didn't deserve it, then our response will be, Yes, Lord, use me. I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. I want to show the same love that you've shown to me all over the world. Here am I, God. Use me. Send me. 
Why is it that more Jesus followers don't pray this prayer? Could be because they haven't thought of it, maybe. I think it's probably because they're afraid because it really is a very dangerous prayer. I'm thinking it probably because they're afraid because it really is dangerous. Break me, dangerous. Search me, dangerous. Send me, dangerous. I think many people are afraid that God is going to make you sell everything and go be a missionary in Africa and never use a real toilet again as long as you live. What you need to know is that may happen. He may call you to go minister in some faraway land. But you know what? See, when that happens, you've given your whole life to God. Here am I. Send me. You're going, to, you're going to be different because he's going to experience him. And when you do, you can't help but say, God, here am I. Send me. Father, thank you. Send me. Use me. 